Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the second Adam. Amen. I've always wondered why Christians would name their sons Adam. (laughs) And in case you're new here, that's my first name. Shouldn't that be a taboo name in the Christian faith? After all, one of the ways that I sometimes would introduce myself, if somebody had trouble remembering my name, I'd say, well, you can just remember that it's all my fault. (laughs) Or you might object and say, well, but you get the honor of being named after the first man. To which I would respond, yeah, the first one who screwed it up. And that's related to our gospel reading, surprisingly enough, today. The first Adam. And we're going to see how and really answer a bigger question, but also answer the question of why Christians would name their sons Adam. In the Garden of Eden is where our journey begins, all the way back in Genesis. And you may be asking, what does that have to do with Luke chapter 4 and Jesus being in a desert? Well, let me tell you. The image here is right next to one another of Jesus being tempted by the devil, and who else was tempted by the devil? Adam and Eve, born into, created into the perfect creation, the Garden of Eden, before anything had gone wrong. And Adam and Eve get visited by the serpent, Satan the accuser, and he tempts them just like he tempts Jesus in our gospel reading today. And he tempts them by saying phrases like, did God really say? And you will be like God. Your eyes will be opened. You'll know good and evil. And what happens to Adam and Eve? They fell. They fell into sin. And for any of those out there who want to say it was Eve's fault, the scriptures make it quite clear that Adam was standing right next to her the whole time and did nothing. Because right after she takes a bite, it says that she turned to Adam who was standing right next to her and gave some to him as well. They both fell into sin. We call this the fall. And through the fall... This is where I'm wondering why anyone would name their son Adam. We are all born into a fallen creation with a fallen, sinful nature. Paul tells us this. He says, through one man, all creation has sinned. Well, now we skip ahead a few years to the desert and to Jesus. So it's important to note the context here because the context actually draws this connection back to the Garden of Eden for us. See, right before this in chapter, Luke chapter 3, we had the baptism of Jesus where the Holy Spirit comes down and rests upon Jesus. And then there's this odd thing that happens between that and Jesus going out into the, being driven out by that same Spirit into the wilderness. There's a genealogy section, your favorite sections in the Scriptures, I know. You can't wait for those to pop up, all the names that you can't pronounce, and it just goes and goes and goes. Why would you put that in there? Well, this particular genealogy traces backwards from Jesus, so you guessed it, Adam. Drawing this connection before Jesus himself endures the very same situation that our great, 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 however many, Grandma and Grandpa, Adam and Eve, failed to resist Satan in. So in the desert, Jesus is driven out by this spirit into the wilderness to endure this trial. It's not an evil spirit that drives him out there. It's the Holy Spirit to endure this trial, a test, if you will, of Jesus. The fully human portion of Jesus is being tried. Will he remain faithful to God's plan and word that he has sent him here for. And Jesus, this second Adam, is another way we've often referred to Jesus, the second coming of Adam, the personification of all the people of God 
into one man. He's tempted by Satan three times. First, he's tempted. He's very hungry. He hasn't eaten in a long time. And Satan shows up and says, Dude, you're God. You have the power to turn those stones into bread. And, oh, fluffy, airy bread. Wouldn't it taste so good right now? The second time, he tempts him by showing him all the kingdoms of the world in one go and says, These can all be yours. They've been given to me. I can give them away to you if only you would bow down and worship me. Temptation there being to worship someone other than God. The first one, the temptation is to put your hope in something other than God's Word, to feed yourself on something other than God's Word. And then the last one, he takes him to the high point of the temple and he tells him to test God by casting himself down. Because God has promised that he won't let your feet strike against the stone. And Jesus successfully resists the temptation that the devil presents to him. And there may have been more. These are the three specifically mentioned. But it says at the end of the text that once all of those have happened, right? It says, and when the devil had ended every temptation. So there may have been more. But these three are each rebuffed by a very specific thing. Every time Jesus resists the devil, he uses the word of God. He says, it is written. God has spoken to this issue already. You are wrong. I cannot do what you ask because God has spoken. Remember the only offensive weapon that you are given, with that image of the armor of God? It is the sword of the Spirit. The word of God, sharper than any double-edged sword. And here Jesus puts on a fine display of spiritual swordsmanship and his competition with Satan. And really, we know that it wasn't much of a competition to start with. Jesus underwent all of the temptations that are common to Adam. I heard a little word play here. The, The Hebrew word that we have we pronounce as Adam, where my name comes from, means mankind. So all the things that are common to Adam or to mankind, Jesus has endured all of those temptations as yet as well. Yet there is one crucial difference. Where Adam and Eve fail and fall into sin, where you and I fail, yes, even though my name is Adam, I fail too. But Jesus doesn't. Jesus resists successfully. Jesus does not give in to the temptation. Jesus is perfect. The accuser has nothing to bring against him. Now, what does that have to do with you? Well, the Bible also tells us that Jesus, and some of the quotations in our gospel reading are directly from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and chapter 8. It tells us that Jesus is all of Israel, God's chosen people, condensed into one man. And this isn't some mere representation, but it's part of the cosmic switch, the cosmic exchange that Jesus is going to work on our favor and on our behalf on the cross. See, in Deuteronomy, Israel was wandering around in the wilderness for 40 years. Does that sound familiar? We got 40 days of Jesus in the desert. The quote from not living by bread alone is from Deuteronomy chapter 8, when they're mentioning that they've been wandering in the wilderness all this time. Which category do you think the Israelites fell into? They fell in the category of the first Adam, who fell into sin, or do they fall into the category of the second Adam who resisted and remained perfect. They fell into the first, of course, because you and I are the the Israel, the new Israel of God. We have been grafted in through Jesus into the people of God, and just like then and now, we all fall short of the glory of God. We all give in to that temptation So again, Jesus enduring the temptation is a fitting topic for the beginning of our season of Lent because it reminds us of our failures to keep 
ourselves from sin. That's why those images are brought together with this genealogy tracing back to Adam. And how there's a new thing being established in Jesus because the old thing, the old flesh, the old Adam is dead, has fallen into sin, is forever doomed until now. Jesus is different. And it's extremely important that he is. Dear friends in Christ, this is the hope that is within you. And the hope that is within you is not generated by you. That's a first Adam way of thinking. That you can pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. That you can white knuckle it and resist all of those temptations. That if only I learn more, or try harder, or do better, I can succeed. The hope that is within you is not your own. It did not come from you. It was not created or generated by you. It came from outside of you. And as you listen to the gospel reading today, you heard where that hope comes from. It comes from Jesus. And it is given to you. The fancy Latin phrase, just so you know I went to school for this stuff, is called extra nos. If you've ever heard that before, that basically means outside of yourself. Our salvation is extra nos. It comes from the outside. It is not contained within us. We are not capable of making it, generating it, even a part of it. Because we are in the first Adam category. We have fallen into sin. We have not resisted the devil. If you're having a hard time believe that, close your eyes and think back just to yesterday or this week. When you gave into temptation, when you put your energy and time into something less important than you ought, when you got angry or frustrated with the trials and tribulations of your life or the busyness of what is demanded of you and lashed out and hurt someone. Those are all examples of how we are in the category of first Adam on our own. But our gospel reading shows us that a new Adam has come, Jesus Christ. This new Adam endured every hardship and temptation that you have, every hardship and temptation that Adam and Eve in the garden did, and yet remained pure. And this new Adam, this pure perfect and blameless Adam intends through the waters of holy baptism remember what rebuffed the temptations of the devil, the word of God. In baptism the word is combined with the water and the supernatural promises of God are made real. And he takes his perfect record this new life, this new Adam free from the, the marks and damage of sin and he gives it to you freely by grace, a gift of love that lasts forever. Children born of water and the Spirit, you are children who are no longer under the condemnation of the law. You're no longer in the category of first Adam, not because of anything you've done, but because of what this new Adam, Jesus Christ, has done. You are now children of God living in the grace of the new Adam. So when Satan, the accuser, comes along and hurls his fiery arrows and says to you, oh, last week, <laughs> I was there, you said this, or you lied about that, or you hurt this person, or you gossiped about this person, or you had hateful thoughts about your spouse or your children in your mind, you can say, yeah, I did. But Jesus has forgiven me, and Jesus has done what I could not. And so now I no longer live under the law by which you accuse me, but I live under the grace of Jesus Christ. Well, there you go. It's all fixed. Now the name Adam doesn't sound too bad, does it? It's been redeemed by this new second Adam, Jesus Christ, but that's not the only thing that's been redeemed. You have been redeemed. 
you who were once dead in your trespasses and sins, you're now alive in Jesus. You have been and continue to be tempted, and you're going to continue to fail to resist that temptation, and you're going to fall into sin. So if that's still true, what has changed? Dear friends in Christ, everything has changed. Everything has changed. The second Adam, Jesus, has changed everything, for he did what we could never do. He endured every hardship common to mankind, every hardship that you have endured, Christ took upon himself. Pain, hunger, jealousy, sorrow, hatred, and more. And yet never once did he break God's law. Never once did he give in to temptation, and he resists all of those things that we could not and do not. Then he took his perfect record, his spotless past, present, and future, all of his successes, and he exchanged them for all of our failures. He exchanged his perfect past for our checkered one. He exchanged his perfect future for our broken one. And he did so on the cross. This perfect Passover lamb, spotless, blameless, and without defect, shed his innocent blood to wash away the old you and bring to life the new Adam, this Jesus, our Lord. Now all our losses to sin, our failures and temptation, they are gone. Remembered no more. I love the phrase that he doesn't remember them. He's cast them as far as the east is from the west. And just a hint, that's like an infinitely long distance. They're remembered no more. They're gone. We're no longer of children of the first Adam. Fallen into sin, born sinful, destined and doomed to die and suffer eternally because we have been wrapped in the robe of Christ's righteousness. He has given us his perfect record. And he endured, all the faith, he endured all of the temptation that you and I have and everyone in the world and did what we could not. Remain faithful to God. And he did all that for you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the second Adam. Amen. May the peace of God which passes all human understanding. Guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, the second Adam, who has brought you to life and taken away the guilt of all your sin until he comes to renew everything on the final day. Amen.